Okay, we are good now. Good evening, Shiloh Baptist Church. Good evening, all of you who joined us tonight for another exciting Bible study. I'm trying something a little different here tonight. We're actually videoing from my study. And I wanted, uh, and you know, a few minutes ago, we just had a little technical. We haven't done this in a while. But we are here, and you do not want to miss this study. I'm going to give you time to get on. But tonight, we're talking about a very uh, exciting st uh, topic. I am Pastor Duncans, and we are going to be talking about God. We need some answers. We're going to talk about some of the perplexing questions that this pandemic and this age has left us in for the church. Get ready. Wake somebody up. I'm going to answer some hard questions tonight. And what we're dealing with is the topic is a book, one of the minor prophet books that uh, you probably don't study too often, but we're going to go into an in-depth in study into this book. I see people coming on. I'm giving them a chance to, to get in tonight. As I said, I'm coming from my study. Welcome to Word Up Bible Study. Word Up Bible Study is a Bible study where we concentrate on putting the Word of God first place in our lives. We just had a few technical difficulties, so can you call someone right now, text somebody, tell them that we're on and you don't want to miss the content of tonight's Bible study. I will give you just a couple more moments. And then I want to greet you in the marvelous, matchless name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Hasn't God been good to you? Somebody give me a, a something and put something in the chat to let me know God has been good to you today. As we are chiming in, you don't want to miss this exciting Bible study again. We're starting now to the end of, our, of the Advent season. I will be filming directly here from my study, giving you an in-depth look into the book of Habakkuk. All right, people are coming on, but I'm going to pray right now so we don't waste any of our study time. Father God, I thank you tonight for your presence. I ask that you would bless everybody that's listening, everything that's being said, that it would bring you glory and I give you all the glory and honor for what you're going to do. In Jesus' name, amen. Questions. I found this on Questions. The book of Habakkuk says this. And you need to understand this. We have so many questions about church, about religion. Are the Muslims right? Are the Jehovah Witnesses correct? How do we know Protestant faith? Is that correct? Baptist versus Church of God in Christ. Or Pentecostal? Are the Pentecostals correct? Does everybody have to speak in tongues? How does salvation come? Are you an exclusivist or an inclusivist? Do you believe there's more than one way to come to Christ? Then you are inclusive. You believe that every faith has a way. Or are you an exclusivist? Meaning that unless you believe in Jesus Christ, you won't find your way to salvation. So tonight we're going to answer those questions. We're going to answer all kinds of questions. Let me give you some more questions that the church needs to answer, the tough questions. What does the church, I'm not talking about your tradition. I'm not talking about what your denomination says. I'm talking about the heart of God tonight. And how do you deal with, how do we as a church understand and deal with these questions that surely are coming to pass or our churches are not going to be relevant? What am I talking about? What does the church do with sexual orientation? Is every homosexual going to hell? Uh, what do we do with transgender folk? If somebody transgender has a heart for God, do we let them in our church or not let them in our church? What do we do for people who say, I don't want to come to church, but I still love Jesus? <laughs> what do we do with those people? Is that biblical? The word is what do we do for all the suffering? Why did God allow my child to die? Why did God allow my grandmother to go? Why did God allow my sister to pass? How come some people are saved and some don't? And we're praying these hard prayers. Questions, questions, questions. How come I can't seem to get ahead? We are going into the book of Habakkuk because Habakkuk was the prophet that asked questions of God. He questioned God. And this book is going to teach us a lot. Please don't tune me off. Listen to this. God has an answer for the questions, but the book 
of Abaka is saying, and we're saying in this series what God said, I need some answers. The end of all things is our faith. I want you to grab your Bible and go with me to the book of Habakkuk, chapter one. Habakkuk is uh, the eighth of the Old Testament prophets. The prophets were, as you know, minor prophets, and they were only minor, not because they were minor in their statute or minor in what they did. They were only minor in the fact that they wrote uh, a small amount. They wrote a, a smaller amount, three chapters in the book of Habakkuk. That's the only thing that separates the minor prophets from our major prophets, but the word they had, what they said is major. I want you to know tonight, I'm going to share with you. Listen, it's all right to question God and no, don't get this thing twisted. God said, we got to get the heart of Christ. How do we bring everybody into the church in this day and age? Listen to the complaint. Listen to the burden. Listen to what Habakkuk said in his text. Are you with me yet? Go to the book of Habakkuk. It's an Old Testament book. It's the eighth book in the Minor Prophets. And when you get there, you'll find these words. It says, the burden which Habakkuk the prophet did see. O Lord, how long shall I cry and thou wilt not hear? Even cry out unto thee of the violence and thou shalt not save. Why dost thou show me iniquity? Cause me to behold grievance for spoiling and violence are before me. And there are that raise up strife and contention. Therefore, the law is slack. The judgment doth never go forth for the wicked doth compass about the righteous. Therefore, wrong judgment proceedeth. Habakkuk was concerned about the violence and the unfairness and the silence of God in an age where he needed to hear from God. What am I talking about? Habakkuk was a prophet that prophesied right before the Babylonian exile. Right before they went into the Babylonian exile, when Nebuchadnezzar came in, the Chaldeans, we know this from the fourth chapter of Habakkuk, the Chaldeans came in, and when they came in, they took Judah captive. He was one of the prophets of Judah, a contemporary of Jeremiah. And they took Judah cap they took Judah captive. That's when they carried him off. And you get the book of Daniel that talked about all of the uh, young men and the uh, young spiritual folk that were carried off. Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, Daniel, taken into uh, Babylon. And we talk about how they were bought into Babylonian captivity. It's interesting here because the book of Habakkuk, he was actually prophesying not to the people because Judah was in wickedness. He didn't do what most of the prophets did. They prophesied to the people. They get an oracle and they tell the people what God said. Habakkuk came out different. Please hear this. He came out complaining to God that I don't understand. I don't know what you're doing in my life. Have you ever felt like that? Have you ever felt like where you were telling God, God, I don't understand what you're doing. I'm looking around, look like the wicked are prospering, look like other folk are doing okay. And my life is going on year after year after year. And I don't see any significant changes. And the pandemic has just made it worse. How do we get God to hear us? Is it okay? that we question God. I'm going to give you the answer to those questions tonight because Habakkuk was a prophet that did not speak to the people. Watch this. Justice, injustice, evil, wickedness, corruption was all over the land. Watch this. And Habakkuk said, uh, God, I know there are wicked people out there, but why are you letting them stay? I know there's trouble around, but why are you letting this trouble happen? I know, God, you're supposed to love me. I'm your child. But why does it look like wicked people are profiting well before me? That's when Habakkuk, God answered Habakkuk. But Habakkuk asked questions of God because he wanted some clarity. So I'm entitling this study, write it down. Lord, we need some answers as a pastor, as a believer. I need some hard, fast answers for some of the things I'm going through. Is anybody with me? Are you interested yet in what I'm saying? I need some hard, fast answers for what I'm going through tonight 
And with the next three preceding weekend, I'm going to be giving you some answers to some of those hard questions in your life. But first of all, I got to show you how Habakkuk grappled with those questions and what he did to get his answers. So when you go to the book of Habakkuk, first thing you have to understand is Habakkuk was tired of the wickedness and the strife and the struggles and the trouble. He was the eighth of the minor prophets. Habakkuk, Obadiah, and Malachi. Habakkuk, Obadiah, and Malachi were the only prophets that we only know their name. Uh, on, that's all we know about them was their name. We don't have any background. They're not seen anywhere else. I do know that Habakkuk is seen somewhere in the apocryphal books, uh, in, in what we call the apocryphy or the illegal books or the ill-gotten books. So we know that that's not a true spiritual sign or an anointed sign of God. So that's, that could be some made up story. It's not in the canon of the Bible. But what we know about Habakkuk is that Habakkuk asked God questions because he was not going to just sit there and live that way. Listen to me, somebody. Don't just sit there. I'm going to show you tonight how and why God expects you to question him reverently, sincerely. I'm going to give you an okay to question God. And maybe you'll find a burden lifted off of your heart right there as you do that. What we found out about Habakkuk is he called himself a prophet. Zechariah. And Haggai were the only other prophets that actually called themselves prophets. And that's what Habakkuk did. There was a special relationship between Paul and Habakkuk. What we know is that when Paul was speaking in Acts chapter 13, he actually gave a notification of or use a reference from what Habakkuk the prophet, a small prophet, has spoken about. And what he did was when he was speaking about what this small prophet did, he used a verse in Acts 13, 41, write it down. You'll find this verse where Paul was talking. He said, look, you scoffers, Acts 13, 41, Paul and Habakkuk. I'm trying to show you the special revelation between the Apostle Paul and Habakkuk. It's significant when we go into the text. It says, look, you scoffers, wonder and perish, for I'm going to do something in your days that you would never believe, even if someone told you. That's Habakkuk 1 and 5. What's significant about that is that is God's answer to Habakkuk. And what Paul did, this writer of faith in the book of Romans, when he wrote about the preeminence and that faith is what God uses to justify us. Paul used this justification by faith three times in his writings in the New Testament. The just shall live by faith. So here, here, watch this. Stay with me. Us, you and me. You with me tonight, so it's me and you. Maybe you won't want to admit it, but I got some questions, God. I got some questions about what's going on in my life. I got some questions about my children. I got some questions about some of the stuff I've seen. Here's what happens. In this text, Habakkuk says us. God, I, I need some answers. God, here's God's answer. I will answer, but in the meantime, live by faith. Living by faith is the end of the entire means of what God is speaking to us. Where did Paul use it? Romans 1, 17, the just shall live by faith, which means only the justified folk who trust God by faith are going to be able to make it. So ask God all the questions you want, but please, at the end of the day, realize that I still have to live by faith. Why? Um, there's a story of John Kavanaugh. He was a noted, famous ethicist, meaning that he believed in making sure everything he did was ethical. He was famous for going to making sure people were held accountable, but he found the Lord. So he wanted to go to Calcutta to the house of dying where Mother Teresa was. So he took everything he had, traveled to Calcutta, went where Mother Teresa was. When he got to the house of dying, he wanted to know, how do I spend the rest of my life? So he got to Mother Teresa. He said, can you pray for me? And Mother Teresa said, yes, surely I'll pray for you. He had this burning prayer in his mind the whole time he was traveling. He said, will you pray for me? And he said, yes. And he said, pray. She said, what do you need me to pray, my child? He said, pray clarity. I need some clarity right now. I need God to give me some clarity. And Mother Teresa said abruptly, her countenance changed. She said, no, I will not pray for clarity. 
He looked at her and said, but Mother Teresa, you look like you're so clear about where you're going, the direction of what's happening in your life. He said, she said, no, I will not pray for clarity. Clarity is what you need to let go of if you're going to really get blessed by God. If God has to clarify everything to you, you'll never really understand him. He said, then why do you look like you're so clear? She laughed and said, what you, see, what you think you see as clarity is trust. I may never know what and how and why God is doing, come on somebody, what he's doing in my life, but I trust him anyhow. Here's this lesson. God, I need some answers. God said, I will answer, but in the meantime, live by faith. But let me fill in the gaps as we go along. So the Apostle Paul tapped in and told us, if you're going to make it, the just must live by faith. Romans 1.17, Galatians 3.11. Write it down. The just shall live by faith. Hebrews 10, 38. Some people don't attribute that to Paul, but we believe that it is a Pauline epistle. And he said, the just shall live by faith. My brothers and sisters, I'm trying to help you. We're going to ask God a lot of questions and try to get some answers. But one thing we need to realize is the just has to live by faith. Habakkuk found this out as we go through this book, we'll find out that Abaka had four complaints he had for God. You're going to find out five woes from God, some things that are going to happen. And Abaka was not satisfied. And then in chapter three, you're going to find that famous prayer where Abaka said, the just shall live by faith. We have to trust God. So let's go here. Before I, before I go into that first chapter, write this down or understand some things. Here are some applications we can learn from Abaca. Here's some scripture that'll bless you as you're trying to wrestle with what you're going through. The first thing I want to tell you tonight, I got it straight from the Holy Spirit. It is permissible to ask God questions. It is not permissible to go to God in a way that is irreverent, in a way that you're asking God just to be sly or you're being smart. But when you really have a question, don't you know, just like you would not turn your child away? Listen, I'm telling somebody now, when you get off of this study, you need to go find you a corner, ask those hard questions. Sometimes you're scared because you don't want to get the answer because you don't trust God. I just said what I said. Sometimes you're scared. And that's showing you may not trust God. But if you trust God, then you will be at a point where whatever answer God gets, can I get a witness? Whatever answer God gives me, I trust him. I don't know. I don't have clarity, but I have trust. And so sometimes I know my God is proven faithful. Somebody can look back in your life and you can see that God proved faithful even though you didn't have clarity. Come on. How many of us know? I didn't know what God was doing, but God blessed me anyhow. That's right. And that's what you got to continue to do. Even when it looks like things are going topsy-turvy, how many know God can turn it around? Even when it looks like the enemy is winning, how many know God will put you back on top? Even if it looks like you stuck in a place. Oh, I'm feeling the Holy Spirit right now telling me somebody out there think you're stuck where you are. Can I tell you you're not stuck? Follow what Habakkuk did. Habakkuk said, I want some answers. And God came forth with an answer that was going to bless him. So the first thing we're going to learn is it is permissible to ask questions of God. How do you know that, Pastor? Because here's the scripture. Exodus 3 and 11. Remember Moses? Moses said unto God, when God was calling Moses, Moses said, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring the sons of Israel out of Egypt. Exodus 3 and 11. Very clear example. Moses was humble. He was reverent, but he said, who am I? Another example is Mag Mary Magdalene. Remember when the angel came on her? Mary said, I haven't slept with anybody. How am I going to have a child? Mary said, how can this thing be? Look, guys, if you have a question, you need to ask God now, God, why is this like this? And if you're going to God reverently, God will answer. Let me back up because I hear somebody asking the question. If it has to do with you, God is concerned. So you need to make sure you ask God the question. What is the next? In Romans 9 and 20, but you can't go to God any kind of way. In Romans 9 and 20, we got this answer when the Israelites, remember when God grafted us in, us, the church, and remember the Jews didn't believe in the Messiah. And so 
uh, Paul was writing in Romans 9 about us questioning how God could prefer uh, Jacob over Esau. And here's what Romans 9 and 20 said. But who are you, O man, to answer back to God? Will what is made say to the thing that made it, why have you made me like this? Understand the difference. If you're asking God a question to further your walk in his kingdom, to bless where you are, to get an understanding of your calling, to be more effective in his kingdom, God says, I got an answer. But if you're just complaining and getting smart with God, why she get blessed and I didn't get blessed? That's a complaint. That's not a question. How come I'm getting treated like that? That's a complaint. That's not a question. You know the difference now? A complaint is not a question. Habakkuk was giving God what's known as a complaint, but it was a complaint or a question about where he was and what was affecting his life. So don't go to God getting smart. Go to God and make sure you know. So the first thing is, it's all right to ask God the question. Listen for his answer. Second thing we're going to learn from Habakkuk is sometimes it's not evident what God is doing, what's going on, especially when we're suffering or we're going through a time where it looks like our enemies are winning. But here's what we need to understand. Isaiah 55, 8 and 9. Am I going to bless you right now? Isaiah 55, 8 or 9. Even when you're going through a time of suffering, even when it looks like the enemies are winning. Here's what Isaiah 55, 8 and 9 says. God said, look, my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are my ways your ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. What you got to know is if I'm going through something, can I bless somebody? God has a higher place. God has a higher thought. God has a higher place for me. I need to tell somebody, if you're suffering now, look for your promotion. If things are going down now, praise God for your promotion. Because God said, even though in your mind you can't understand what I'm doing, I'm just setting things up so that I can bless you fully. What I'm telling you is, even though it hasn't come to pass, don't stop. God is always in the motion that his thoughts are higher. I believe scripturally that always means that God not only knows what he's doing in our life, but he knows how much further he can take us if we get out of the way. Mm, hallelujah, somebody. God knows how far he can take me if I quit messing up stuff. God knows how far he can take me if I would just trust him. Listen to James. If any man lack wisdom, James 1, 5, and 6. If any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God who gives generously without reproach and it will be given him. But let him ask in faith, nothing doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea and is tossed and driven. Here's what God is saying. When you go to God and ask him a question and you really want the wisdom to come in your life, ask him by faith. Watch this. What is faith? Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. What is faith? Without faith, it's impossible to please God. What is faith? Faith is believing in what I can't see, but what I know the scripture says. So when you go to God and ask for wisdom, go in faith. Your mind still may not be receiving it, but as long as you keep trusting and you keep believing in faith, God will turn the situation into an area that you can receive it. Why? Because God knows more than we know about what's going on. Can I bless somebody tonight to tell you, even though you may not understand what's going on in your situation, that means nothing to God. His thoughts are high enough that he's going to bless you and bring you to a place of blessing. So not only will we learn from the book of, of Habakkuk that it's all right to question God, Find you a place to question reverently. Not only will we learn that God's thoughts are higher than ours because we don't know what God is doing. Somebody might as well be honest and say, I don't know what God is doing. But the third thing we can learn from the book of Habakkuk, watch this. This book shows us that God is sovereign, omnipotent, and all things are under his control. Somebody ought to say right now watching me, God is in control. And I'm not. God is in control. That shouldn't be a scary thing. That ought to be a, somebody ought to shout that God is in control. How many know I'm glad God is in control and I'm not in control? Because when God is in control, he does things in my life that I would never think of. How many got a testimony that when God was in control, he blessed me in a way that I didn't know God was going to do it. I just got to look back and wonder how God blessed me that way. Write this scripture down. God is in control. How do we know that? Psalms 
135 and 6. Listen to what the Bible says. Whatever the Lord pleases, he does. In heaven and on earth and in the seas and in all the deeps. God is in control. Hallelujah. He's in control everywhere. Do you know he's in control of heaven? He's got our eternity. He's in control of our now. Hallelujah. He's in your house right now. He's got control of your children. He's got control of your bank account. He's got control of your prosperity. He's got control of your mind. You can't go too far down because somebody ought to say God is in control. And when God's in control, it means I don't understand. But Abaka said, but I will trust the just shall live by faith. Not only that, 1 Chronicles 29, 11. I love this. This is talking about the sovereignty of God. 1 Chronicles 29 and 11. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty for all that is in heaven and in earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head above all. God is sovereign. Check me, y'all. Devil, spirits, demonic spirits, God. God is way in control. I don't care what you're going through right now. You ought to take peace to know that God is in control. Habakkuk's giving us these lessons from his text. Not only that, he says sometimes, here's a good one, you just got to be still and know God is working it out. Somebody here tonight got it. That's what faith says. I'm hurting. I'm suffering. I'm trying to be real with you. I don't understand these questions, but I got to be still and know God is working it out. How do I know that? Ephesians 1, 11. I need you to write this down. In him, we have obtained an inheritance. Can you go to Ephesians 1, 11 with me right now? Somebody read this with me because it just hit me that you need to see these words. Uh, if, if you can, I don't know if you're watching by your phone and you have a Bible. But listen, listen intently if you can't go to it. In him, in Jesus Christ, we have obtained, have obtained. Somebody say, I already got it. We have obtained. Somebody say, I already got it. You're living off your inheritance right now. I've already got it. He said, we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. Not our will, but his will. Do you understand me, my brother? Do you understand me, my sister? Your life is being counseled by the will of God. And check this. It was God's will that you be in his kingdom. It was God's will that he let you into his family. It was God's will that you be uh, blessed and highly favored. It was God's will that you be placed in a position that God could touch you. You are in God's will. And don't you ever be scared of God's will. I tell this story all the time. The only place I don't want to be is out of God's will. You can, you can take the world, take all the riches, uh, take folks, faith. you know, when people start talking about you and you want to be on their side, so you jump off of God's side onto their side in their conversation, cut that out. All you're doing is messing up the one safe place on earth. The one safe place on earth is God's will because God's will for my life is that he wants to bless me. What else do we know about the book of Bach? These are all the things I'm going to teach you from this book. I'm just giving you an intro so you know how powerful, because we don't usually look at Habakkuk. We're going to learn that he is the one who says what he is and does what he says. He says who he is and does what he says. Numbers 23. Write this down. Put this scripture down somewhere. It's one of my favorite. I keep this scripture in my heart when I'm asking God for something that I don't understand. But Numbers 23, 19 says, God is not a man that he should lie or the son of man that he should change his mind. He has said it and will he not do it? He has spoken it and he will fulfill it. Somebody ought to say God does not change his mind. So from the book of Habakkuk, we learn that uh, we can ask God questions. We learn we may not understand everything God is doing in our life, especially when we're going through sickness and we're going through struggle. Uh, we learn that God is in control. We learn that God is sovereign, but we also need to understand that God is who he said he is. Is he who he said he is in your life? Then you don't have anything to worry about. And number six is the last thing. Here's where, here's where Habakkuk landed. So go with me. We're going to go back into the book, right? And, and look at the complaints. Habakkuk started out with God, I'm your prophet, 
But I'm not going to sit here and just prophesy about these troubles because I know Judah is wicked and I know we've been wicked and I know you love us. But God, why aren't you, or aren't you answering some of this wicked stuff going on out here? Why is there murder? Why people getting away with murders? Why are we living in a place where there's so much injustice? Why is there so much social injustice? Why is the, the rich folk always seem like they're oppressing the poor folk? Why are there poor folk who love you? You know, I had this one guy tell me to, to the detriment that he did not, this is even tough to say, he didn't believe in the mother, in the God of his mother. Watch this. I was talking to him about God, how good God is, Come on to God. He said, uh, my mom went to church every Sunday. She prayed every week. And yet, my mom was broke. We got our electric cut off. We barely had enough food sometimes. I don't want my mama's God. Problem with that statement is, you don't have to worry about um, what God was doing with his mother. I'm going to tell you how that ended in a minute. What God was doing with his mother but the God who interacts with you, here's what God does. He's personal. Please don't compare yourself to somebody else. God wants to interact with you on a personal level. He wants you to be authentic and he will be authentic with you. God is so powerful, so omnipotent, has so much wisdom that he deals with each one of us on our own level. Aren't you glad? He's not holding you accountable to somebody else. He just deals with you on your level. But anyway, I started telling him. I said, well, let me ask you a question. Um... When your lights got cut off, did you have the money to get them cut back on? Well, yeah, they got eventually. Did you did you get food? Yeah, eventually. Uh, so what you're saying is you want a God where you don't have any hard times. Uh, or you want a life where there's no hard times. Tell me who has that kind of life. I, I can tell you rich folk that commit suicide. I can tell you rich folk that are troubled and they have to file bankrupt. There's no such thing as a life that's not... Uh, filled with and have some kind of ups and downs and struggles. What you got to remember is your mama had a God that got you out. That's the reason you're sitting there now talking about you don't want her God, but it was her God that kept you. It was her God that preserved you. It was her God that got you where you are. And you know what else? When your mama was going through all of that, how was she acting? Oh, she was sitting around talking about, you know, get, still giving money to the church, talking about God is good and trust. Okay. So you're worried and your mama wasn't. So here's what I'm trying to tell you. If you serve your mom's God, you'll find a God that even when struggle, I know I got a witness, even when you're struggling, if you trust God, won't God give you peace right in the middle of your struggle? Won't God help you through the things you're going through because you trusted in your God? All I'm saying is any excuse you make, there is nobody like our God. And that's why let's get into an outline of the book of Habakkuk. I know you're interested God, we need some answers. If you have a question, I'm going to show you how the biblical book of Habakkuk, where God allowed him to complain and God finally gave him some answers. Here's the outline of the book so you can understand it. First of all, the outline is in chapter one, verse one is where we find out that Habakkuk is a prophet. He, he is a prophet uh, and he names himself a prophet. And so what I take away from that is when you are looking at where God has you in your faith and where God has you in his family, please understand who you are and whose you are. I, I, I'm being very uh, serious right now. A lot of you, when trouble comes, you forget whose you are and who you are. You forget where God has already brought you from. There's enough of you watching me now that have so many testimonies about what God has done and a new trouble comes and all of a sudden you forget who you are. In the process of forgetting who you are, you forget who God is. But look at what, go back to your Bible. Look at what Habakkuk said. Habakkuk said, the burden which Habakkuk the prophet did see. Habakkuk said, I have a burden on my life and my God is interested in in my burden. Oh, I want to stop again. Can I tell y'all something? God is interested in the struggle you're going through. Know that tonight. Write that down. Tell yourself, God is interested in my struggle. Now, the burden, actually, the word used for burden there is a burden is not, you know, just a, a struggle I have to survive. A burden, we're talking here, the spiritual burden of what I want to see happen in God's kingdom. Here's what a burden is. If you're riding down the road and um, 
you know, because we're living in dangerous times and you know I'm not going to stop to see everybody. But I've had many a time when I've been riding down the road and I passed somebody. I didn't do it all the time. I'd be lying to tell you if I did. But all of a sudden, God would, something would speak to me like I wanted to turn around and make sure that person had something to eat. I saw they were destitute. I saw who they were. I don't do it all the time, but sometimes I will. I believe that's a spiritual burden that every child of God has to have a betterment of someone else. So uh, Habakkuk's burden was not for himself. It was for God's people. Why are you treating your people like that? You want to get a blessing? Quit trying to get things for yourself and, and start asking God, why is this happening to that person? Soon as God hear you thinking about somebody else, another blessing comes in your life. But look at what, look at what Habakkuk's burden was because the outline tells us that Habakkuk's first complaint, listen to it, been there, you and me. Here's what Habakkuk said. Oh Lord, how long shall I cry and thou will not hear? Even cry out for the violence and you won't save me from it. Look what Habakkuk said. He said, why does the evil going on in Judah, his first complaint, why is this evil going on and you're allowing it to happen? I know I'm not the only one that's been there. there. There's things in our life we want to know, why does this befall our children? Why did this befall? I'm faithful, God. I, I come to church all the time. I praise you. Why do these things happen to me? Why is Why am I going through such hard mental days and dark times at night? When I'm trying to serve you, Habakkuk had a burden. Why is this going on in my life constantly? Why do you show me iniquity and cause me to behold grievance? All right, let's back up. Let's talk about that. Let's unpack that. Habakkuk said, Lord, um, how long shall I cry and you don't hear me? What is God's purpose for allowing me to cry? What is God's purpose for allowing me to struggle what is God's purpose for allowing me to see some of the violence or some of the struggle within myself? Why did God allow me to see me in the middle of this? Oh, please go with me. God uses our times of struggle. Watch me, y'all, for emotional stability. Come on. All the crazy people say, yeah, yeah. How many of y'all know if I did not have that moment where God was with me when I did go through the crazy moment, I would not have been able to handle it because I, God didn't allow me to see any crazy moments before I went to the crazy moment. But how many know now I can act sane even in my crazy moments? I know that may not make sense to somebody, but there is times when you got pressure in your life constantly. But what God does, he allowed you to go through periods of that pressure so you're strong enough to handle it no matter when it happens. Come on, somebody know what I'm talking about. How many of you know there was a time when you went through some stuff and you thought you were going to die? That same thing hit you now and you sitting there eating some toast and egg sandwich because you realize that God is in control of it and you don't even worry about it. Here's what I believe. God allows me to go through trouble so that I can have mental stability. I think that's the number one thing. Mental health is at an all time, especially under this pandemic. Mental health is what, I know none of y'all don't want to admit you crazy, but I'm talking to some crazy people and I know it because I've been through it also. So here's what God is saying. I'm going to take you through a midnight hour. I'm going to take you through a struggle where by you should lose your mind. Then I'm going to send my anointing to keep you sane. And then when the devil sends that same thing on you, you're going to be so blessed you won't even, you won't even have to worry about it. That's why God allows you to see it. I believe Habakkuk, because wait till God's answer come to Habakkuk. He was letting Habakkuk know that, you know what? I'm letting you go through this because right now you need to go through this. So when something comes on you that's not guided by my hand, it won't make you go under. How many know a sickness came that you didn't think you could handle? Cancer. A trouble came that you didn't think you could handle. Got to notice you're going to be put out of your house. But how many know because of the past stuff I've held on to God? What God? So I said, why, why God let me see all this? You ought to be shouting when God lets you see all that. Because with all you've seen, man, somebody looking at me right now, you you are somebody the devil can't touch just from all you've seen. A bur Habakkuk said, I got a burden for the kingdom of God. God said, okay, why you got that burden? I'm going to take you through some struggles just to see if you can handle it, because I believe you want to build my kingdom. So what I'm going to do is get you so low and see if you can stay there, but I'm going to make sure I'm guiding you. Then when the enemy comes, he'll have trouble knocking you down. He said, watch this. 
Why do you show me iniquity? Iniquity is always something within. All right. All the people that got questions for God. How many of us know that God also has to show us our iniquity? Okay, Pastor, you you messing up now. I don't have no iniquity. Yeah, you do. How many of us know that in our life, God has to show us that we're good. You know, we're trying to serve him. But most of us trying to serve him know that every day there is still a spiritual battle with our own internal iniquity. Don't y'all make me preach. Just, you know, just send me a okay in the chat. Let me know you understand that. That while I'm asking God, why doesn't he do this? God is also looking at all the stuff I do. And while I'm doing my stuff, God still blesses me. <laughs> Somebody ought to say hallelujah. So what God so what, what God was showing Abaka, he said, Abaka, I'm letting my people see all this iniquity so they'll appreciate me. How many appreciate God better when you know that God already knows what you did, what you said, what you thought, but he blessed you anyhow, and you appreciate him better because you know he's never left you or walked out on you. I love the fact that God stays around when I smell good, and when I don't smell good, I hope a saint know I'm using biblical language right now. How many of y'all know there are times when my sin is sending a stench in God's nose, but he still allows me to keep my position, to keep my title, to stay in his family, just like you would your child. How many of you know there's a time when your actions of your child sends a stench in your nose, but you hold on to that child and you'll run out in the midnight hour to bail that child out? You know why? Because even though that child may be stench now, may have a a stench on him now, you still love him. And the love, the odor, the perfume of your love, the perfume of God's love covers up all of our stench. But he shows us so we can appreciate. Man, God still bless me. I mean, I was talking about folk. I was, I was thinking some very bad things. And yet God still loved me. Look what Abaka said. Go to verse four. He said, and God, this, he's, still, he's still complaining to God. He said, Lord, you won't stop the violence. Look like other people are being raised up. Uh, you know, other folk are being raised up. They, they make strife and contention, but they're still being blessed. And Lord, they don't even consult your word. And looks like your judgment never comes forth on them. Uh, the wicked, they go about doing anything they want. I'm trying to live righteous and you won't judge them. Oh, hear me. Abaka sounds like us. He said, Lord, here I am in the middle of this stuff. I'm trying to live right for you, but you won't judge all these wicked people. And God had to give him an answer. I believe sometimes God shows us our iniquity so we're not so hard on our brothers and sisters when they have their iniquity. So sometimes God shows us our iniquity so that we can understand that God has been merciful and gracious to us. So we should be merciful and gracious to other people. But that's not Habakkuk's point. Habakkuk's point was, God, how long? When? Anybody got a how long question? Anybody got a win question? How long, God? When is this going to stop? Listen to God's answer. It will blow you away. God said, behold, verse 5. Go to chapter 1, verse 5. You among the heathen and regard and wonder marvelously, for I will work a work in your days which you will not believe, so it be told to you. Did you hear that? God said, sometimes you, you marvel at what's going on with the evil, but I'm going to do a work in your life, in your days, in your season, right now in the season you're in. God said, I'm going to do a work, but I can't tell you because you wouldn't believe it if I told you. Don't miss that. God is saying, the stuff that I have for you is so good that if I told you where you are, you will not even believe it. And the next verse is going to let you know, you may not even like the way that I'm going to do what I'm going to do in your life that's going to be marvelous to you. What God is saying, I'm going to do something in your life. It's going to be so marvelous, but you may not like it. You better hold on. Don't, don't turn me off. You already hear this. Verse six of this text, he said, for lo, I'm, I'm going to raise up the Chaldeans. That bitter and hasty nation, which shall march through the breadth of the land to possess the dwelling places that are not theirs. Verse 7, they are terrible and dreadful. Their judgment and their dignity shall precede themselves. Their horses are swifter than leopards and are more fierce than the evening wolves. And their horsemen 
shall spread themselves and their horsemen shall come from far. They shall fly as an eagle that hastens to eat. They shall come all for violence. Their faces shall sup up as the east wind. They shall gather the captivity as the sand. And they shall scoff at the kings and the princes shall be, be a scorn to them. And they shall deride every strong hole for they shall heap dust and take it. Watch what God said. This shall change his mind and he shall pass over and offend imputing this his power unto his God. Stay with me. Here's what God just said. You won't understand what I'm getting ready to do, but I'm getting ready to send Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians to capture you. They're going to bring horses. They're going to take everything away from you. They're going to come in like an eagle flying. They're going to, they're going to be hungry. They're going to eat your land up. They're going to eat everything up around you. He said, I'm getting ready to bring in the Chaldeans. Listen to me, somebody. I'm trying to explain something to you spiritually. Sometimes, check the pattern. God shows us our iniquities. He shows us uh, the grief. He, we, we complain to him about evil. God said, I'm going to fix it. You may not like the way I'm going to fix it. But first thing I have to do, and it's all it boils down to, is something you heard all your life. I got to fix y'all. How I'm going to fix you is... I'm going to send somebody in who is going to take you captive and capture you. And they're going to do everything. They're going to destroy you. They're going to take over. They're going to take places that's not theirs. They're going to take all your stuff. But look what happened. He said, but in verse 11, then you'll change your mind about the evil you're doing. You'll pass over some of the stuff you were doing and you will give your Credence back to God. Here's what God said. I'm going to put you in a position where you have to trust me so you can learn to trust me. I can't just pull you out all the time without letting you go through and suffer something. But when I let you go through and suffer something, you will give the allegiance unto me when I go through. When you get through, you'll say, God, how many have done this? God, I don't know how you kept me during that time. Have I got a witness? Anybody ever said, God, I don't know how I got through that. Anybody ever said, Lord, all hell broke out. I don't know how I survived. Have you ever thought back in your mind on something you went through and you shuddered saying, I don't know how I dealt with that. And the enemy even tried to bring the thought back. I know I'm not the only one. You got a thought in your mind saying, man, I can't even think about that thing again, how the enemy comes. But God helped you get through it. Here's what I need you to know. When God is doing that, he's in control. Oh, thank you, Holy Spirit. I want to speak to a brother and sister tonight. The sickness, the struggle you're going through, the marriage relationship, the struggle with your children, the stuff you're going in with your mind seems like life is not just worth it. All of that is God saying, hold on to me. I'm going to do a work. That I can't tell you about it. I'm going to show you because it's going to happen in your day. But you need to know the evil that you're going through now is nothing compared to what I'm getting ready to give you. Somebody ought to shout right there with me. God is getting ready to do something. He told Abaka, Baka, I hear you. I know you got a burden. He said, but right now I need you to know that even though you're going through this, you ought to see what I prepared for you. I can't tell you. See, that's what happened when we want the clarity. We want God to tell us. God said, I'm not going to tell you. I'm going to show you. How does God show me? He keeps me through my darkest moment. He keeps me when the enemy thinks he got me down. He pulls the enemy off of me when struggles come. He lets me go through stuff I didn't think I could go through. He brings me back, resuscitates me when I thought my life was over. How many times did he thought your life was over and God came and was a restorer? Uh, he was a rebuilder. He was a renewer. How many times have you been to the place where you said, I don't deserve it? And God showed you by putting a big hug around you, put his arms around you, hugged you and said, yes, you still do deserve it. When I chose you, I knew what was going on and I chose you to bless you. That's why God told Habakkuk, I'm going to do this. Now watch this. Habakkuk wasn't satisfied with that answer. Here's what Habakkuk said. Wait a minute, God. Are you the God? Verse 12. Listen to what he said. Are you the God from everlasting? Oh, Lord, my God, my holy one. <laughs> Check that out. Sometimes don't you want to tell God that? Are you that holy God that's allowing all this mess in my life? Are you that straight? Look what he said. He said, verse, don't, he said, look what he said. Oh, Lord, you have ordained them for judgment. Oh, mighty God, you have established them for correction. Habakkuk said, you're bringing those evil folk in. They worse than us. Look at verse 13. Thou art pure eyes than to behold evil and can't look at iniquity. Wherefore thou comest upon us. Bring those upon us that deal treacherously. Holdest not their tongue. 
When the wicked devour the man that is more righteous than him, he said, God, you're bringing the Chaldeans. At least I'm trying to serve you. Why are you bringing those people to hold us captive? They take up all of them with an angle. They catch in their net. He just went on and said, they're wicked. They're wicked. They're wicked. He came back and asked God, why would you use them? Therefore, they shall slay. Uh, look, look at verse 17. Shall they therefore empty their net and not spare continually to slay the nations? Habakkuk said, God, why are you using that? I'm not that bad, am I? We all think like that, right? Come on. <laughs> I'm not that bad. Why? God said, I know what I'm doing. Oh, somebody ought to take that tonight. I know what I'm doing. I'm going to use the Chaldeans. And I know they're wickeder than you. Now, God's, I, I can't give you the rest of it. We're going to start chapter two next week. God's going to show you, I'm going to take care of the wicked. But in the process, look what I'm making out of you. I want to close on that note to tell somebody, look what God's making out of you. Let's talk about it. That's right. I'm not afraid to talk about it. Yep. You're going through struggles that are unfair. Yep. You got some questions. Look like God hasn't answered. You went through 20 and now you went through 21, 22 coming and you still don't see a significance of what God has been doing. But look what God, right in front of your eyes, look what God is making out of you. Can I close with this little anecdote? Um, this man started working at this wheelbarrow uh, factory. He was he was a crook. He he had a record. He was reformed, but they hired him. And this one man just didn't trust him. You know how some people just uh, don't let you live down your past. Help me, somebody. That's a whole nother sermon. But this man was actually working in this wheelbarrow factory. And every night when he went home, this one man said, "I'm gonna watch that joker." And every night the man would come out. And he would wheel wheelbarrow out, and the man would stop him at the gate, search the wheelbarrow, look inside of it, and the man had nothing in it. And he would let the man go. This happened five times. Every night, stopped him at the gate. What's going on? He didn't know what was going on. Ten times. Stopped him at the gate. Checked the wheelbarrow. Nothing was in it. At the end, when the man was about to leave the factory, the man said, I know you were stealing something. I know it. He couldn't figure it out. Another buddy came to him and said, wait a minute. Have you ever figured out something? You were looking for something else, but he was really stealing wheelbarrows <laughs> right in front of your face. Do you know something? You're looking for relief from that trial. You're looking for God to just make it better now. God said, no, no, no. You don't see what I'm doing right in front of your face. I'm creating a saint that can hold its own through any storm. Hold her or his own through any storm. I'm creating a saint that knows how to pray. I'm creating someone who knows how to worship me in their worst moments. I'm creating somebody who won't backslide. I'm creating somebody who understands the beauty. I'm creating somebody in a relationship with me that knows how to call on me in the midnight hour early in the morning. I'm creating somebody that'll ride down the road and sing songs unto me while they're driving in their car. I'm creating somebody that don't care if nobody else worships God. They're going to worship God anyhow. I'm creating somebody that when they don't understand, they'll walk around saying, but God is good. Come on, where you at? If you put yourself in the chat, if you understand, that's who you are. God is good. It's just saying, God is, God said, why you been looking for what I've been feeling, what I've been doing? I've really been creating you over again. God is good. Here's the theme of Habakkuk. Don't miss next week. We're going to jump on channel two, chapter two. It's only three script chapters. But here's what the theme of Habakkuk is. God, I got some questions. Next week, I'm going to get into more of the doctrinal questions. But I got, I got some questions. And God says, I got some answers. But keep living by faith. God never said I wouldn't answer you. God never said I wouldn't fix it. All God said is, but if you keep living by faith, you'll understand. Habakkuk started out angry with God, ended up, chapter 3, with his famous prayer that says, the just. Those who trust God shall live by faith. So come back. The end of all of this is God's faith. But here's what God says. I'm not afraid for you to question me. I need somebody. Uh, right now, I need you to do this. Go somewhere. Maybe you don't want nobody here. Maybe right now you just want to 
when you turn this off, just ask God. Everyone knows hurting questions in your heart. Why did this happen? Why did this happen? Why did that happen? How long, God? Ask them all of it. Sit and listen and watch God bring favor by giving you an answer that brings you closer to him. Read chapter two of Habakkuk. Well, you can read the whole book. You'll be with me next week. We're going to actually dive into word by word, verse by verse, chapter by chapter, how God answered this powerful prophet, Habakkuk. Um, go to our website. You can give into this ministry. We take Cash App, Facebook, I mean Facebook, Cash App, um, Giveify, PayPal, any of those. Go to our website and you'll see that. But um, for now, leading up to this Advent season, I'm going to be teaching this powerful book of Habakkuk. And tell some people, if you got questions, tune in here because next week I'm going to be on those hard questions. I'm going to talk about the nomination. You know, I'm going to talk about all that stuff. Be with me next week. God bless you. This is Pastor Duncan saying, God doesn't care if you ask him any questions and he always will answer you if you come to him by faith. God bless. Have a good night, somebody. I, I trust you that you will continually trust God. Amen. Just come around side. Just turn on. This is this is us working from a study tonight. Okay. Yep.